Well, it is good to have you here today in Bellingham. I also want to thank you in Skagit for being with us today. We're so glad that you're here. And you know, it is that time of year. It just is. It's real evident everywhere you look. And, that, and there's songs that talk about this time of year. You know, Christmas time is here. Happiness and cheer. Fun for all the children call their favorite time of year. All right? Or it's the most wonderful. You, yeah, you know, I heard someone this week say, whoever wrote that song ought to be punched in the face. Because there's so much going on, and the whole thing about time this time of year, and the timing during this time of year, and with the right timing on things. I mean, it happened this week with Thanksgiving, especially on Thanksgiving. The whole timing issue is a big one to make sure everything happens at the same time, and you kind of work backwards, knowing how big the turkey is, how long it needs to cook, to put it in the oven to make sure that it's timed right so that the rolls can get in and they can get back out in time for the meal, so that all this happens at the same time. Very much important that it's all in conjunction with whatever time time the kickoff is so that you know for what game you're going to go watch and those kind of things. The, the timing is huge. Or the timing for Black Friday. What time do stores open? What time should I be there to make sure that I'm there at the right time? Obviously now we've given uh, Black Friday a rest. We just start on Thursday now and just but make sure that we know what time these stores open. And then there's all these, these other issues with, with time, knowing what is the right time to start playing Christmas music. For some of you, it's July 5th. I don't think that's the right time. In my estimation, it starts after Thanksgiving is the right time. That's the right time for Christmas decorations to come out, in my opinion. I don't think that your house should be lit before Thanksgiving, but that's just my humble opinion that's right. And there's all these things about time and all this time. And all these times in, in this time of year, all lead up to one thing. They all count down to this culmination of time, and it's this day that we celebrate, and it's, it's Christmas Day. Now, this isn't anything new. In the very beginning, from the very first Christmas, this whole countdown of time was a part of it. In fact, in Galatians, we read these words, Galatians chapter 4, but when the, and here's the interesting thing, when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under law. This, when the time had fully come, and there's a lot that goes into that statement, that the time had fully come on a, on a global level with the Roman Empire. There were some things that had happened that this was the perfect time for God to send his son in, in the divine, providential, impeccable timing of God with the Roman Empire, that the world, the known world, was relatively united. There was relative peace in the world because of the, the Pax Romana, the peace of Rome. Now, granted, that peace was enforced by their strong military. The Roman road system was all throughout. All roads lead to Rome. You've heard that phrase. And there was a unity and there was a peace. And there was a common language, Koine Greek, that everyone spoke. And during this time, this time in human history, it was the fullness of time. It was the right time for God to send his son. Now, in the church calendar, this time is not just a day, but it's an entire season. The season of Advent. And I suppose... If you could sum up the season of Advent in one word, it would be the word expecting. That there's this longing fulfilled, there's this hopefulness, there's this, this desire, this anticipation, this expectation that there would be this fulfillment of this hope. And you think about it in the Christmas story. I mean, all of heaven had been waiting, expecting something to happen. From the pages of Genesis 3, there was this God tipping his hand about someday there would be this woman who gives birth to this child that would give us the, the, the victory over sin and death. Even from Genesis 3, all of heaven had been waiting. And throughout the pages of the Old Testament, this prophecy about this Messiah and Israel had been waiting for hundreds of years expecting this one to come. And then in the story itself, when, when the old man Simeon, sees the baby Jesus, and he's like, and I've been expecting this, I've been waiting for this, I can die now, I've, my life is fulfilled. The Magi coming from the east were coming expecting to find something as they follow the star. The shepherds who'd been out in the field, they come to see this thing which has come to pass, expecting to see something. But there is one who, above all others, was quite literally expecting, and that was Mary. And the Bible says this in Luke chapter 2. The time, again, the time came for the baby to be born, and she, talking about Mary, she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. Here's Mary expecting 
Th this picture of Advent, she's physically expecting a baby, waiting, longing for the fulfillment of this, not only physically, but spiritually as well. Now, I can't speak to this aspect of the Christmas story. I've never been pregnant. I will never be pregnant. I have no desire to be pregnant. So I thought it would be good to have someone speak to this issue that maybe had more knowledge. And so since my mom and, and her husband Larry are here for Thanksgiving, I thought I would have my mom share. Would you welcome my mom as she comes up to talk? Great. This is my mom. Some of you have met her before. Thanks for being here, Mom. Welcome. Kip's got a good a microphone there for you. Oh, uh, yeah. All right. There's a lot of love there. All right. It's kind of awkward, first time they've met. <laughs> so um, my mom is here. As I said, some of you have met her before. Um, she's always been mom to me, but mom has a long list of uh, a resume. I mean, she was a pastor's wife for many, many years. She taught Sunday school, taught Bible studies. She... Um, she was ordained, uh, went through ordination process, at one point was, was given an honorary doctorate uh, degree by Warren Pacific College. And so there's always this question of, you know, what do you, what do you call her? You know, wh what do we call you? Oh, you know, I've thought about that a lot. Some people say, we call you doctor, reverend, missus, what? You know, I'm just a humble person, and I think my claim to fame was uh, being a mom and raising my children. So if you are worried about it, just call me Reverend Mother. <laughs> <laughs> I can handle that. All right, so we got the Reverend Mother here. It's kind of sound of music-ish. All right, <laughs> uh, so I want I want um, I want to ask my mom if she would share a little bit about expecting, especially with me. Now, some of you are aware of this, some of you are not. Um, the birth of Jesus had a very divine uh, piece, a miraculous piece. My birth did as well. Um, I I don't know if you're aware of this, but my parents didn't tell me this until I was out of college. That before I was born. Before I was conceived, my dad had gone through a procedure to guarantee that they would have no more children. <laughs> and then I was conceived. And when I found this out in my 20s, I said, well, why didn't you tell me sooner? And mom said, we didn't want you to feel like you weren't wanted or we didn't want it to affect your self-esteem. And I said, what are you talking about? This is the great, I am like super sperm, jumping the chasm, no barrier is too big for me. I mean, it's, this, this built my, my whole, uh, you know, my self-esteem up. But anyway, Mom, you were... You, were, uh, oh, you know yeah. what? I do believe in immaculate conception because that is exactly how he got here. But <laughs> <laughs> uh, he wanted me to talk a little bit about what it felt like to be expecting. And um, a as your third child, who, you were, who was a surprise... Uh, a, that gift. a gift. An yeah. opportunity. <laughs> okay, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> and it did turn out to be a challenge and a gift. <laughs> and a <laughs> Those of you who know him. But you know what? Um, it, it was just, um, ju you know, you, you, those of you who have been moms know what it is. You know, you just have this, uh, this tug of war between anxiety and expectation and anticipation. And for me, it was like, what will it be? It was before the days of the tests. And so I had no idea whether I was having a boy or a girl. And uh, so we would throw around all kinds of names. And so just all of that mixed, you know, of, of growing bigger and uh, wondering how this is going to be, what it's going to be. Uh, is he going to be all right? Is he going to have all his toes and fingers and whatever? And uh, just, you know, and then he was late. And uh, we think, uh, are we really going to have him or what? You know, it was just really different. I just think about Mary. She had something one up on me because she knew she was having a son and she knew what his name was going to be because fathers in those days in the Jewish history, the fathers always gave the child the name. And God said, you will have a son and you will call him Jesus. Well, I didn't have that. I just didn't know what, it was, what he was going to be. And so we were really surprised when he was born. But um, before he was born, I think I was about a month out of uh, my due date. Why do you look at me? I don't remember this <laughs> stuff. <laughs> you were there. You should remember. Okay. <laughs> uh, it was, I was about eight months pregnant, and we were going somewhere, and we were hit head on by a, a drunk driver in a logging truck in Louisiana where he was born. And I just remember uh, laying on alongside the road. They laid me out. 
uh, afraid I was going to have the baby right there on the side of the road, which would have been interesting, but I really wasn't open for that. But the one thing I do remember is when they put me in the ambulance, uh, there was like about an inch and a half between my stomach and the roof <laughs> of the <laughs> ambulance. And they took me to the hospital, which only added to the anticipation and the anxiety of uh, am I going to go into labor tonight off of this accident or not? And after a few hours, they did let me go home and said to just be aware of what could happen. And so our attorney, who was helping us with this situation, he says, you don't settle with the trucking company until that baby's born to make sure that it's okay. So, you know, it's just when you're expecting, you have all kinds of things thrown into it, and some of you know that better than I do. But it was just, uh, you know, for most moms that I talk to, especially first-time moms, when you have a baby and you're expecting a baby, you think in your mind, you know, an 18 to 20 year commitment, that's not too bad. Only to find out after 18 or 20 years, it's a life sentence. <laughs> <laughs> you never quit being a mom. And even going through some of Bob's trauma from the first breakup of a girlfriend onto all the things he's dealt with, I hurt with him, I hurt for him. And I just think of Mary when she saw Jesus on the cross. Her heart had to be hurting big time. And it's the same way today with being a mom. You never, ever quit being a mom. You're always concerned about your kids. And you know when they get older, how old are you? <laughs> when they get older, they have sometimes have always that Band-Aids can't put on. And that's when a mother's heart really hurts and comes around and begins to pray and care and love them. And so, Bob, I just have to say one thing. Um, it's, you have redeemed yourself with your <laughs> unexpected appearance, and uh, my life would not be complete without him. And uh, so being expecting is um, a, it's a two-way street. You anticipate it with great joy, what this is going to be like, but also that anxiety and that unknown. And I'm sure Mary had that even more. I didn't have to travel to Bethlehem on a donkey, but I did have to travel to the hospital in an ambulance before he was born. Yeah. So there might be a little similarity there. It might be. All right. Well, the blessed uh, Reverend Mother here. <laughs> um, you know, one other thing, uh, one of the small detail, uh, it's not small. I was nine pounds, 10 ounces when I was born. 11. 11 ounces. Nine pounds, 11 ounces when I was born. And I came out so fast, I, I broke my collarbone. I broke my collarbone. So and I was not feeling like I was being abused. Not you what it did to me. <laughs> 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 well, Mom, thanks for carrying me, not only for those nine months, but uh, throughout life. And I uh, appreciate uh, you not only doing that, but. Well, you know, the, I do want to say one apparently. more thing. <laughs> I just wanted to borrow a quote from our first original parent. And it's in the Gospel Writers. And this is what we heard from, what they heard from the clouds from the first parent, which would be God. This is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him, Cornwall Church. Oh, hey, thanks, Mom. Hey. Well, you know, when you, when you think about uh, this whole thing of, of expecting, um, and you think about Mary expecting. Sometimes I think for us in the Protestant church that this is what we have. Now this week when I went up in the attic and brought stuff down, Mary uh, was wrapped up in bubble wrap, which is always fun, right? <laughs> wrapped up in bubble wrap and left in the attic in a box for the last 11 months. And then we pull her out because she's got a bit part in Christmas, right? And the little, the nativity. But so often we keep her put away in a box, put away in bubble wrap, and, and we just kind of give her this little bit part in Christmas. And yet I wonder, is that enough? I, wa I wonder if there maybe is there some, something more that we ought to know about Mary. And with that, th the contrast that or the other end of the spectrum is with the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church that would give her great admiration, even devotion. Some would even worship her. And in the Catholic Church, there are many days that they would honor Mary throughout the, the church calendar. Three that are predominant, December 8th, uh, which is, is the whole thing of, of the Annunciation, and, and then January 1st and uh, August 15th. Big days in the Catholic Church surrounding Mary. 
when you think about this continuum, I think when it comes to the issue of Mary, there's a continuum in religious circles between eminence and ignorance, between the eminence or even preeminence, if you will, about exalting her, about um, uh, honoring her and, and giving her the respect that's due to the very pendulum swing to ignorance. And usually it's one or the other and there's not a lot of middle ground. And when I say this ignorance, I say it because very often for some of us who were raised in the Protestant church, because Mary stayed in a box in the attic most of the year, the things that we think of most when we hear stuff associated with Mary is football. You hear Hail Mary, the first thing you think is the pass. The Hail Mary pass, of course. And that started in the 30s with Notre Dame and the Four Horsemen and these passes. It was made famous with Roger Staubach, who was a, who was a devout Roman Catholic. When you hear someone talk about immaculate conception, sometimes we say it's reception, duh. That pass that happened on December 23rd, 1972 between the Oakland Raiders and the, and the uh, Pittsburgh Steelers there in Three Rivers Stadium. And so there's this ignorance that's uh, surrounding these things of Mary. And even if there's not ignorance, even if we know some of the facts and some of the details, maybe it's ignorance, that we ignore her that we downplay her importance, that, that we don't give her any respect that's possibly due. And most likely, I would think, that is because it's a, a reaction, a pendulum swing, a knee-jerk reaction to maybe in the Catholic Church, some that we see would be going too far. And so in order to avoid that extreme, we go to the entire other extreme. In the Magnificat, which we're going to look at in two weeks, in the Magnificat, Mary makes this statement when she says, my soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has been mindful of the humble, uh, the humble state of his servant. And then this phrase, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. You could almost put this footnote in, from now on, all generations will call me blessed, except Protestants. Except Protestants, because we don't even talk about her let alone call her blessed. And so what I thought I would do is that I thought uh, I would take the time this year to spend the next four weeks talking about Mary. Now, I've done character study series on Daniel, on David, on Esther, on Jonah, where we'd spend four, to six, even eight weeks on these different characters. But I thought it'd be good for us to spend four weeks on Mary. And I'll say this right up front, that the servant, sermon today is really kind of an introduction to the rest. Everything else is built on this. And my hope and my desire in this introduction today is to maybe bridge this gap, and I'm just going to use the broad terms, between the Protestants and the Catholics. That maybe I could break down some barriers. Maybe we could find some middle ground that we would agree upon. Maybe some area where we say, you know what, there are some things where we can learn some things from our Catholic brothers and sisters that maybe we've put in the closet for far too long. We put it in the attic. We put it in the box for far too long. Because you cannot deny, you cannot deny the impact of Mary. The best known, most influential woman who's ever walked the planet. And yet in the church, we spend more time talking about, though it's not a, not, uh, a bad thing, the woman at the well, the woman caught in the act of adultery, the widow and her might, all these other women. But we in the Protestant church don't spend a lot of time talking about Mary. So I want us to do that. I, I want us to look at, at Mary. And when I was putting this together, I was thinking about uh, the series and thinking, what should we call it? My first thought was this. How about Mariology? Now, ology is the study of, you know, biology, the study of life, those kind of things. And I thought this would be good, Mariology, the study of Mary. But it, it felt a little too academic. So I thought, okay, well, then how about this? How about Mary Christmas? Okay, a little too cutesy. I mean, it works, but it, it makes Mary a little bigger than Christ in the Merry Christmas thing. So I kind of don't want to do that. So I thought, okay, well, how about this one? There's something about Mary, and I knew I would get all kinds of pushback on that one. So I said, we're not even going to go there. All right. And then, then I thought, okay, well, then maybe we'll go with Mary. Did you know? Kind of playing on that whole song deal. Like, nah, nah, I'd have to spend so much time explaining it or I'd sing the song or whatever. My favorite thought was this. I thought this could be perfect. Mary for dummies. Because most of us in the Protestant church, we, we don't know a lot of stuff. Or, or maybe we should change that out and say, Mary for Protestants. Uh, I thought, of that. well, 
with all my good ideas, I brought that to the creative arts and, and decided uh, that we would stick with uh, expecting. So expecting is it, this whole idea of expecting. And, and my prayer is this, that as we look at Mary, as we learn, we look at this, that we would come expecting to learn some things from this woman who's amazing, this woman who's, who's blessed. In putting this series together, there are three books that I read. Two of them uh, I wouldn't recommend, not because they're bad, but just because the level that they're written. There's one book that was very influential in, in which I, I borrow heavily from, and it's a book called The Real Mary by Scott McKnight. If any of you say, man, I'd like to take this series or this, this subject a little bit farther, that's the book I would recommend. I also had one other major source in this series, and that was an interview I did with a priest, uh, Father Gary Zender, who grew up in here in uh, Whatcom County, but now is, is a, a priest down in... Um, uh, Renton area, and uh, did a phone interview with him saying, just give me a crash course from the Catholic perspective on Mary. And it was absolutely fascinating, the things that, that he, he uh, shared with me, some things that I wasn't aware of, some things that, that maybe the Catholic Church officially teaches but aren't followed to, to the level that they said uh, should be. So with that, I would say that one of the big differences between Catholicism and Protestantism is this, and, and I learned this years ago, probably 15 years ago. I went, uh, I went to Whistler with, a, with uh, Father Jim, was at the Assumption Church in those days. Went to Whistler, it was great. You know, three hour drive up, I could ask everything I ever wanted to know about Catholicism, but was afraid to ask, it was great. In that day, when I had all these questions answered, there was one phrase that he made that said, turn the light on for me, of understanding. And that is, in the Catholic Church, tradition, Church tradition holds equal authoritative weight to Scripture. So whereas we would say, you know, well, we're, we're based on Scripture, they'd say, we're based on Scripture and the traditions of the church. So whenever I would come back to them and say, well, what about this? Where do you find that in the Bible? It's a thing that has developed the tradition of the church. And so when you understand that about Mary, there are some things that the Catholic Church practices or believes about Mary that you won't find in the Bible but are as a result of years of tradition. With that, there are things found in the Bible that we in the Protestant church just look over. And so I, I hope that in the midst of this whole series, that for some of us raised in a Protestant church, we'll have a clearer picture of this woman who is called blessed, that we will give her the honor due, that we will learn from her life. And for some of you who are maybe from a Catholic background, some of you who just went along with everything you were taught, that maybe you'll understand some of what was taught and why it was taught, and that maybe we find some common ground in the midst of all this. Now, in this series, we're going to be spending the next uh, three weeks, next four weeks, in Luke chapter 1 and 2. And here's what I'll do. Throughout the series, there will be times when I'll interject some of the Catholic tradition to explain it, but my desire is to look at what does God's Word have to say. Because what you find is that in the Bible, there are approximately 217 verses that are associated with Mary. Now, some of those Old Testament, some of many of them New Testament, for some Catholics, they would take that number a lot higher because of some of the stories in the Old Testament they see as a, a type of Mary, a foreshadowing of Mary. I want to stick with the ones that are pretty more, uh, much more overt about Mary. So with all that said, let's take a look. If you have your Bibles or your, your phones or your tablets, you can turn to Luke chapter 1 and 2. You can just do that every week when you come in here because we're going to be um, really camping in that. When we look at, at Luke chapter 1 and 2, we discover a little bit about the one who wrote this. Luke was not one of the disciples. Luke was a companion of Paul. This we know that Luke was a physician. There's a chance that he wasn't Jewish. There's a chance he may have been Gentile. But we know this, that Luke wrote the book of Luke and its companion, the book of Acts. And he wrote them probably as a, as a volume one and two uh, in this series. And he starts this whole thing out, and he says this in Luke chapter one, many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us, this is important, by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. Therefore, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, it seemed good also to me to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus. This is who he's writing to, this Theophilus, which is a cool name, friend of God. All right, so, so that you may know the certainty of the things that you have been taught. Now, 
He says, I went around and talked to the people who lived during that time, that saw it, they, they were there. That's where I compiled my information. There's a very strong case that can be made that one of the eyewitnesses that Luke talked to was actually Mary herself. Because there are some things that are unique to the book of Luke that you don't find in the other Gospels, specifically having to do with Mary, specifically having to do with Jesus' birth. A lot of what you find in Luke 1 and 2, you don't find in Matthew or Mark or John. And some of the things that we'll look at. There's even one later in the book where Jesus is teaching, doing this, this, this uh, very deep teaching. And out of the middle of, of something, Luke's the only one that includes this. In Luke chapter 11, it says this. As Jesus was saying these things, a woman in the crowd called out, blessed is the mother who gave you birth and nursed you. Now, if I was ever teaching and a woman in the crowd screamed out, blessed is the mother who ever gave you birth and nursed you, I'd say, mom, be quiet. Okay, because, because that's this whole deal. Now, now, it probably wasn't Mary, but, but Luke has this, this um, there are parts of his, of his gospel that lead you to believe he actually talked to Mary about these things. And so we're going to look at, at some of the th- stuff that was written about Mary, about, um, about the birth of Jesus in the book of Luke. There's not a ton that we know about Mary. We know that she was a young virgin. We know that she was from Nazareth. Nazareth, as you may remember, later Nathaniel, when they say Jesus from Nazareth, he says, can anything good come from Nazareth? Nazareth was this dinky little two-bit town that no one gave any credence to. It would be like if someone said, and, and, and she's from Alger. <laughs> A lot of fun there. All right, so, so Nazareth, she's from Nazareth. Uh, not only that, but, but she's a, a poor uh, young lady. Uh, her family was a part of, of what is called the, the Anna Win, which is the, the pious poor. They were poor, but they had a hope that the Messiah would come and would do away with oppression and bring justice. And she was betrothed, which is for us, the best way to describe it is a combination somewhere between engaged and married. It's, it's more binding than engagement, but it's not yet married. And, and that's, she's betrothed to a man named Joseph. That's all we know of her early life. And all that's found in just a couple of verses that Luke records for us. In Luke chapter 1, we'll start at verse 26. In the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored, the Lord is with you. Now, the The portion of scripture we're going to look at tonight is referred to very often as the Annunciation. Annunciation. And that makes you think of a teacher that's trying to get you to quit mumbling. Annunciate. It's more than just a way of speaking. Annunciation was this announcement from the angel Gabriel. He's annunciating. He's he's giving her an announcement. And what we look at is really the root of, of what is probably the second most frequently prayed prayer in all of human history. The first most frequently prayed prayer is the Lord's Prayer, our Father who art in heaven. But probably the prayer that has been prayed second only to that in in amount of times is what is often referred to as uh, a Hail Mary, a Hail Mary. Now again, for some of you, you were raised and you said it all the time. If you ever prayed the rosary, you prayed it a lot. If you ever went to confession, maybe you were told to say it many, many times. For some of us, the closest we've ever come to it is, Hail Mary, full of grace, help me find a parking place. You know, especially this time of year. And that's about the extent of no no disrespect. I'm not trying to to belittle. But uh, what I'm saying is, for some of us, we never have ever prayed this prayer. For masses of humanity, this prayer has been prayed over and over again, this this Hail Mary. Now, you heard uh, Marie which is kind of a nice play on the words here. Marie, sing Ave Maria today. Beautiful. That, as far as I know, has never, ever been sung in this church. Um, I do remember once, years ago, 15, 20 years ago, uh, there was a young man who had gone to Western, played in our worship band. He was a violinist. His name was uh, Randy Gregory. On his last weekend, I said, Randy, would you just play? I mean, he was just an amazing violin player. So would you play something? And so he played this beautiful rendition of Ave Maria, just an instrumental. And it was amazing at some of the kickback that I got from that, some of the feedback saying, why are we playing Catholic uh, Catholic songs in this church? I'm like, it's just a beautiful classical piece. Well, yeah, but it talks about praying to Mary, and oh, it's like, whoa, 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 slow down. 
So some of you who are already starting to write letters of, hey, why'd you have my Ave Maria? And, Whoa, <laughs> slow down. Let's just kind of breathe and take a look at this thing. Now, as I said, some of you grew up with this. Some of you uh, said this over and over again. I don't know that this has ever been said at Cornwall Church, but the Hail Mary goes like this. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. So what I want to do today is take a pass at the Hail Mary. And I want us to just kind of separate out because some of us get nervous about this whole thing. It's like, well, are we becoming a Catholic church? Listen, I am married. I'll never be a priest. Okay? No, we're not becoming. But I want us to learn. I want us to learn some things from this. So I want us to just kind of walk through it. It starts off and it says, Hail Mary, full of grace, uh, the Lord is with thee. I believe that's the next slide. Um, yeah, there it is. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. I say, okay, yeah, that sounds real Catholic. But if you're following along in Scripture, you realize that this isn't just some Catholic saying that was, was made up. This is actually Scripture. Luke 1, 28 says this. The angel went to her, this is the whole annunciation, and said, greetings, i.e., hail Mary, you who are highly favored or full of grace, the Lord is with you. So this part of, of the Hail Mary is actually nothing more than what the angel said to and about Mary. When he says to her, greetings, you, you, you're highly favored, you, you're full of grace, and the Lord is with you. Now in this, Mary, it says in verse 29, was greatly troubled by this, confused and wondering what's going on with the, this whole thing. I, I, don't, I don't get this. And so the angel comes back and, and says this in, in verse 30. But the angel said to her, do not be afraid, which is always his opening line, right? In the Christmas story, every time he shows up, he just says, hey, whoa, 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 don't freak out. That's what he always says. Says to her, do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. There it is again. She's, there's something about this woman that has caused her to find favor with God. And while he now kind of calms her, her nervousness, he then throws, drops the bombshell that completely muddies the water. When he says this in verse 31, you will be with child and give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus. Important here, names meant a lot. Jesus was the Greek form of Yeshua, Joshua, which means the Lord saves. It's a picture of who would be coming here, who this baby would be. You will give him the name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the most high. Wow, amazing. The Lord will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. What he says to her is, listen, this is no ordinary baby. This is no ordinary pregnancy. You are no ordinary woman. Now, little, little uh, tradition addition on this. This is why or how the Catholic tradition of immaculate conception came into be. The idea about immaculate conception really has nothing to do with Jesus' birth. It has to do with Mary's birth. The idea of immaculate conception is this, that in order for her body to be a vessel pure enough to carry the very Son of God, that she would have had to have been without sin. And so taking this, this idea and thinking it through and, and talking about it, the, the Catholic Church in 1854 put into dogma this idea of immaculate conception, that Mary was born without sin. And so... Since God originally intended for all of us to be born without sin, but because of, you know, Adam and Eve, because they would say, because Mary was born without sin, they will often refer to Mary as the second Eve, because she's the second person, second woman ever to be born without sin, and here's this chance for the Savior to come. That's where that immaculate conception comes from. It was made dogma in 1854. Meanwhile, six months earlier, Mary's relatives, some say cousin, probably an aunt and uncle, maybe even a great aunt and great uncle. They're quite a bit older than her. Zechariah is a priest. And when he's in doing his priestly duties and he's burning incense, 
the angel Gabriel appears to him and talks about his wife going to have a child. Now, she's old, and then they've been barren their whole life, and he asks some questions, and he's kind of given this gag order because of that. Read it for yourself. But, but in that, his wife, Elizabeth, gets pregnant. And it's an amazing thing. And, and the baby she's carrying, anybody? A little question for you? John the Baptist, got that in, in Skagit? Okay, got John the Baptist. So Mary goes to this relative, and this is what it says. At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. This is her relative, maybe a great aunt. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, this is so cool, the baby leaped in her womb. You don't think that's cool? I think that's cool. She's six months pregnant. It's not like, ooh, feel him kick. He's doing, as Pastor Kip would say, he's doing cheetah flips in the womb, and he stuck the landing. He's leaping in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Before, yeah, now listen, he will later be called John the Baptist. It's not like it was Zechariah and Elizabeth the Baptist. That's not a last name. That was a title. Maybe he was called John the Gymnast before he ever started baptizing. He leaps in her womb. She's six months pregnant, and he's doing these little flips in her womb. Now, back to the Hail Mary. It says this in Hail Mary. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Now, again, we're saying, okay, I'm a little bit worried about us exalting Mary too high. Now, wait a second. Let's go to Scripture. In a loud voice, this is Elizabeth. She's just been filled with the Holy Spirit in a loud voice. And maybe, this is probably not accurate at all, but her husband, Zechariah, was not able to talk after that whole incident in the, in, the, in the temple deal. I'm wondering, maybe he couldn't hear either, and so she's used to screaming for the last six months. Or, or maybe she's just a woman. All right, in a loud voice, she exclaimed, <laughs> sorry, that one won't make it for the next service. All right, in a loud voice, she exclaimed, blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you'll bear. See, this is nothing more than quoting scripture. This is exactly what Mary said. I mean, what Elizabeth said when Mary comes in and, and there's this going on in her womb and she goes, whoa, blessed are you among women. And blessed is the child that you'll bear. Blessed is the fruit of your womb, Jesus. And the Hail Mary, it goes on. And this is, up to this point, it's just been scripture. Then it says, holy Mary. This is where some of us start going, oh, okay, this is back to the icons and the paintings and the statues. And she's always wearing blue and there's always a halo and got this whole saint thing. Holy Mary. Let me remind you that the word holy in its simplicity means set apart. Set apart. Uh, we try to make it so much more. It's set apart to God. And isn't the truth that when we are following Christ, that we are holy, we are set apart. I mean, we looked at this a few, a few weeks ago. Therefore, as God's chosen people, and here's this word talking about us, holy and dearly loved. When Paul writes to the letters to some of the churches, when he writes to Ephesus or, or the Philippi, he says, to the saints in Ephesus, yeah, to the saints in Philippi. When, when he writes Colossians, he says, to those who are holy, so this isn't unfounded either, that we're called to be holy. We're called to be saints. This is where it gets really sticky. The next, next phrase says this, mother of God. We're going like, ooh, again. Any of you, when you hear that mother of God, any of you at all say, okay, I, I got a problem with that phrase. Let's just be honest. Anybody? If not, we can just go on. Okay, just the two of us. All right, all right. <laughs> that whole mother of God, because what it makes it sound like is that, is that, Somehow Mary is elevated above God and that somehow now she is, she is the source of God, which puts her above the Trinity, and, and, and I struggle with that whole thing. This idea that, that Mary is the mother of God, it's referred to as theotokos, the car theo, God, tokos, the carrier, the Mary of, the source, the, the Mary, the, the, the mother of God. And we struggle with this. But let's go back to Elizabeth. And Elizabeth says this. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord, hold on to that, the mother of my Lord should come to me? This word Lord, there's a time when Thomas sees Jesus after the resurrection. He says, my Lord, my God, as if they're synonymous. This Lord, the word curios, the, the Lord. And I wonder, this phrase that in the Protestant church we really wrestle with, 
So we'd say, well, I'd be better if it was like mother of Jesus or mother of the Lord or mother of, of Christ or something. But mother of God just sounds so, so, I don't know, beyond what it should. Let me tell you about the origins of this title. In the early church, in about the year 431, at the Council of Ephesus, there were these differing beliefs about Jesus. Some said that if he was truly God, that he couldn't be human. And other people said, well, he's truly human, so he's not really God. And there was this, this discussion and this argument about, is Jesus truly God? Is he truly human? And so they came in, this, in the Council of Ephesus in 431, came with this, this terminology that, and this idea that he is fully God. So when you see this phrase, mother of God, even if it kind of inside you recoil, it just feels weird. The truth is, this statement says a whole lot more about Jesus than it does about Mary. What it says about Jesus is that he's fully human. He has a mother, but he's fully God. And if you struggle with that, I mean, that mystery, here he is like us. He's one of us. He's Emmanuel, God with us. He put on flesh, but he is God. And that's right in line with what Scripture says. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 15, it says this, He is the image of the invisible God. He's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Verse 19, For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. Or in chapter 2, verse 9, for in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And then when you jump over to Philippians in chapter uh, uh, 2, verse 5, it says, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature, in very essence, God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. When you begin to understand that, even if it feels weird, the truth is the statement, mother of God, says incredibly beautiful things about our Savior, Jesus that he's just like us, and yet he's completely other. See, up to this point, I've got no problem with the Hail Mary. It's, it's all a scripture. It's all theologically sound. The difficulty I struggle with is in the last phrase. And in the last phrase, again, thinking about the way that Catholicism would hold on tradition with the same amount of weight as the Word of God, this last phrase wasn't added until, I don't know, like 150 some years ago. And this last phrase is this. Pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. That's weird to me. That we would ask Mary to somehow pray for us. So I asked Father Gary about that. I said, tell me about this whole praying to Mary thing. He said, okay, we believe in the communion of saints that we're all a part of the church, present and past, and will be future. Even for those who've gone before us. Like in Hebrews where it says, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, those who've gone before us. And he said, in, in our thinking, in our understanding, that we are a part of this communion of saints, that Mary is a part of the church as well. And she gets this title, the Mediatrix, this, this one who mediates for us, this, this female who mediates for us. And he said, in our thinking, to simplify it, it's no different than when you go to a friend and say, hey, would you pray for me? I'm going through a difficult time. You're asking for intercession. And so we just ask Mary for intercession. I said, okay, well, I get that. I don't agree with that because I don't find any basis for it scripturally. But at least I understand it. At least that makes more sense. So as I, as I was talking with him, as I was reading, as I was studying, even this, this Hail Mary I thought, you know, there's a whole lot more that we have in common and that we ought to embrace about this woman, Mary. So I asked him, I said, Father Gary, do you ever find that people in the Catholic Church take what you guys teach to a level that you never intended it? And he laughed. He said, all the time. He said, we don't tell people they should worship Mary or pray to her and that, and that all. In fact, he told a Catholic joke. And, uh, okay, all right, all right. But it's only because a priest told me this, all right? So a priest walks into a bar. No, I'm just kidding. No, he, he said, there's this Catholic joke that we have. He says that, that Jesus shows up in Italy and there's this, this humble woman 
who's kneeling before the Madonna, and she's praying the Hail Mary, and Jesus is taken by her devotion. And he says to her, Maria, Maria. And she keeps praying to Mary. And he says again, Maria, Maria. And she keeps praying. And he raises his voice, Maria, Maria. And she turns around and says, would you shut your face? I can't you see I'm talking to your mama. And he says, you know, that's, that, that's not what we encourage. That, that, and what we'll see is that Jesus points, or Ma Mary points to Jesus. And so, yes, it can be taken too far. But you know what has happened for us, and I'm using very broad terms here, that we have fallen so in love with the baby that we have thrown the mother out with the bath water. And I think that that's just as bad. That somewhere in between, there's this, this place where we land, where we can learn. We can learn from Mary. And that in that, it will push us in our devotion to Christ. All right, back to the, back to the, to the Luke passage. As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, Elizabeth said, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. And I wonder, as we embark on this, this journey together, could we maybe be open to learn with expectant joy? The same way that Gabriel came with this message of this blessed woman. The same way that Elizabeth said, why, why am I so honored? The same way that John the Baptist was doing flips in the womb as the, the mother of Jesus brings Jesus in. Could we not learn with expectant joy? The final verse in this Luke passage that I'm going to look at today. Blessed is she who has believed that what the Lord has said to, to her will be accomplished. All right, so here's the challenge. Here's the takeaway. We're, like I said, we're going to spend four weeks in Luke 1 and 2. And one of the things that we will see is a phrase used at least twice when it says this about Mary in, in Luke chapter 2. It says, but Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. Here's my challenge to you. That this week, the scripture reading plan that we have on our app, on the website, in the link every week, the scripture reading plan is based in Luke 1 and 2. I want to challenge every single one of you to get involved in that reading plan and not just read through it and say, ooh, check that off the list. I want you to stop, when you get to points about Mary, to slow down your reading and ponder them and find out what is it that I can learn from her life that she would be highly favored of the Lord, that I could apply those things to my life as I walk with Jesus, as I grow in my relationship with God. So this week, the challenge for every one of us, and then we're going to just keep digging into it for the next three weeks, is to look into Luke 1 and 2. Anyway, I'm excited about this. I've learned a lot about it. Hey, Skadget, we're going to turn you over to Pastor Kip. Uh, thank you for being here. We'll see you next week.